In this section, we'll look how, as the 1932 election approached, Hoover faced increasing criticism. As the Depression worsened and it became more apparent that Hoover's program was inadequate, uh, you really begin to see cardboard shanties appearing around the country as a number of homeless grew, and they sarcastically called these little villages of homeless Hoovervilles. The New York Times spoke of a Hoover Valley, a section of Central Park where men had built makeshift shelters out of boxes and packing crates. Journalists in Chicago wrote of several hundred homeless women who slept in Hoovervilles on the city's, in the city's parks. Sensing the, the public's rising hostility, Hoover became angry and withdrawn. He, he avoided personal contacts and sort of barricaded himself in the White House. Uh, he communicated with the press not from press conferences, but from impersonal press releases that, uh, you know, that, that sort of uh, urged self-help, and, and that's about all it did. As relations with the news media soured, not surprisingly, his press secretary resigned, and Hoover replaced him with someone everybody hated, and the press jokingly said that the appointment was the first known instance of a rat joining a sinking ship. A man once universally respected for his administrative skill and humanitarian efforts was now portrayed as bumbling and hard-hearted. Uh, here we see a picture of a, a sign that reads, Hard times are still hoovering over us. The growing protest in 1932 proved sort of a public relations debacle for Hoover as he sought re-election. Midwestern farmers formed Farmers Holiday Associations to to force prices up and they would try to withhold grain and livestock for the market and protest for higher farm prices. Here we see members of the Farmers Holiday Association blocking a farmer who's trying to bring his livestock to market. Uh, the leader of the movement said, uh, you can no more stop this movement than you can stop the revolution. I mean the revolution of 1776. Uh, Farmers would pour their uh, milk into the river, and of course, journalists would take a picture of it and, and uh, you know, juxtapose it in the newspaper against a, uh, a hungry child in the cities. And it, it just uh, made it appear as though, you know, there was a solution, but uh, the government wasn't finding it. Uh, and, and it really added a, a lot of pressure on uh, Hoover. The worst for Hoover was the infamous bonus march in June to July 1932, only four to five months before the election. After World War I, you recall, the government had refused to pass a massive veterans bill, but did agree to a pension to be paid in 1945. Again, that was, we know, the end of World War II, but of course when they passed it at the end of World War I, they didn't know that. Anyway, uh, that had been no problem with people uh, with veterans during the 1920s when all of them had jobs, but now that they lost their jobs, they wanted their money now. It was sort of, in their view, services, I mean, payment for services rendered. In 1931, a Texas Democratic congressman introduced legislation to change the pensions to be paid immediately. And uh, in June 1931, just under 20,000 War I veterans descended on Washington to lobby for the bill's passage. This became known as the famous Bonus March. Hoover resisted the bill. Again, Hoover was worried about the debt and simply said that we're not going to be able to pay it until 1945. Most of the 20,000 veterans, when the bill was uh, defeated with Hoover's help, you know, went home. But 2,000 of them moved to the Capitol, and they said they were going to refuse to leave until they got their, uh, their bonus, said one protester, I fought for this flag in France and I'm going to fight for it now. A nervous Hoover sort of overreacted and, and ordered the army in. On July 28, 1932, only a, a few months before the, the presidential election, a force of a thousand soldiers with tear gas, tanks, and machine guns drove the veterans from their camps. Uh, you know, you can imagine what this was in the media. Here we have uh, the protesters, probably wearing their World War I veterans and carrying the American flag, scuffling and fighting with uh, American soldiers wearing the American uniform and flying the American flag. It looked almost like a civil war, and it did absolutely nothing to help Hoover's re-election campaign. 
leading the U.S. troops to break up the uh, bonus marchers was General Douglas MacArthur. Here he's shown standing next to his aide at the time, Dwight Eisenhower. Of course, Eisenhower was later uh, the President of the United States and MacArthur's superior. Uh, for most Americans, the, the sight of U.S. soldiers fighting with U.S. veterans ensured that Hoover's re-election efforts would fail. Once again, I always kind of felt sorry for Hoover. He's often portrayed as fiddling while Rome burned when that was just not true. He'd moved uncomfortably for him, but it just wasn't enough or fast enough for how the, bad the economy was. To a certain extent, uh, I believe anybody who was in office when the Depression it was probably doomed politically, whether it was their fault or, or not. This concludes the uh, section on the criticism that uh, Hoover faced as the 1932 election approached.